breaking. The Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a concrete company that wanted to sue a union because this, a strike cost them money. And here's the part where we have to get into like the whole uh, are reasonable for Democrats as the judges. The 8-1 decision means the company Glacier Northwest Inc. can sue a union over a strike when truck drivers left wet concrete in their trucks. The one dissenting judge, Kataji Brown Jackson, there's one dissenting judge. What the fuck is the point of, and, and like we well, have- Well, let's talk, we, I have this here. Oh, you dude, wanna... cause like, like, I wanna like, like yeah. we, we've had like Brian Fallon on and I, I appreciate those efforts um, to like, you know, try to recreate uh, for Democrats what the right has for judges. There needs to be a reassessment that it is a massive failure. Like it, this is absolutely appalling. This decision. So okay, uh, to w what Matt was alluding to, and and this broke in the middle of the show, but the Supreme Court has made a decision, and the only dissenting justice, as Matt said, was Katanji Brown Jackson, and good for her on that front. But the majority in this in this um, case here was. It, the majority opinion written by Amy Coney Barrett, but joined by Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. And Thomas and Alito wrote separate opinions, essentially saying that the court did not go far enough. But the the, the Milheiser uh, in in Vox wrote this up and you can read the full article um, it, it, if you if you just look it up. But some of the highlights or lowlights, as it were, from this case are. Um, the Supreme Court handed down an absolutely confounding decision on Thursday, which will encourage employers to bombard their workers unions with lawsuits if those workers go on strike. The court's decision in Glacier Northwest versus International Brotherhood of Teamsters watered down a rule intended to protect workers from duplicative law, uh, lawsuits that can drain their union's finances. As I mentioned, yeah, Barrett wrote the opinion. Um, Milheiser says the silver lining is it does contain some language limiting the scope of the victory for employers. But again, the real just disgusting nature of this is that Sotomayor and Kagan joined on. Um, Glacier Northwest involves unionized workers at the company that mixes and delivers concrete in its own fleet of mixing trucks. These workers allegedly timed their strike to begin after some of Glacier Northwest's trunk trucks were already filled with wet concrete, forcing the company's non-union employees to race to dispose of the concrete before it hardened and did significant damage to the trucks. That's before, pretty badass, though. <laughs> I mean, I love that. <laughs> Showing why they're useful, why they're needed. It's a point of leverage, and that's fine. Before Glacier Northwest, it was uncertain whether, whether a union could time a strike in this way. On the other hand, one line of cases establishes that a union has a legal right to strike, even if that strike will lead to the destruction of perishable goods. A decision by the NLRB, a kind of quasi-court that hears disputes between unions uh, and employers, sided with milk truck drivers who struck even though their strike ra uh, risked spoiling the milk before it was delivered to customers. Another case handed down by a federal appeals court reached a similar conclusion regarding striking cheese workers. But <laughs> the Supreme Court put, put that aside, sided with Glacier Northwest here. Uh, in any event, Glacier Northwest's allegations against their striking workers fall somewhere in between uh, two extremes. Uh, there was another example that, that Milhauser cites here. Wet concrete does not present the same risk as uh, molten iron. That was the counterexample. Yeah, this part's, I guess, less relevant here. But um, before Thursday, the court's precedents laid out a very clear process for what should happen when there is uncertainty about whether a union or employer acted within the bounds of federal labor law. Under San Diego Trade Union Council, or sorry, under San Diego Trades Council versus Garmin, in 1959, when either a labor union or an employer engages in an activity that is arguably protected under the law, the, then the NLRB must first decide if the activity was, in, in fact, protected. If the NLRB concludes that a union acted within its legal rights, Garmin held that uh, the matter is at an end and the states are ousted of all jurisdiction. Alternatively, if the NLRB concludes that federal labor law does not protect a union's actions, then the employer may pursue a lawsuit against the union in state court. The point here is that this is, yes, it's an incredibly like anti-union decision, but it's also another effort by the courts to make determinations and inject themselves in what federal agencies are kind of delegated to determine. And the NLRB process had been sound up to this point, but the, the Supreme Court chose 
to make its own determination here and naturally side with the employers. Good on KBJ for being the only dissenter in this instance. Uh, and disgusting that Sotomayor signed on um, and, and Kagan. And to Matt's point earlier, the fact that, like, we do not have a mechanism to vet these justices that goes through labor unions is a massive problem because like a lot of the lawyers and the judges that Biden the and the elite. Democrats are pulling from are corporate lawyers are. Yeah, exactly. People who do not have any labor background. They just have liberal inclinations on things like abortion and other things. And like don't that. represent a large part of the American population who don't have those sorts of credentials. And, and the Federalist Society and the mechanisms that they have on the right are immensely robust. Um, and they have the ability to vet these people for extremism uh, as a, as well, a good to thing. To the extent liberal donors are going to like put money behind people, they're not going to put money behind people that are going to like vote the right way on a strike uh, decision yes. like this. So this is an example of not just the fact that there's an absence of a liberal apparatus to vet ju judges, but that even the smaller liberal apparatuses are desperately insufficient because they do not represent labor power. And we're going to see more and more of this if, you know, Democrats don't have like some overhaul in their process. Um, and they don't. Um, the, and this idea, I, I'm seeing way too many people that need to go back to the uh, Ian Milheiser uh, interview we did on this uh, thing saying like, well, that sounds like vandalism. In this country, it is legal for a corporation to throw hundreds of people out of, say, health care access because of a labor action. But it is not legal to uh, do anything that might uh, impact any sort of uh, capital investment. It's absolutely appalling. And this is what the Supreme Court does. Like th this, anytime there's like too much uh, uh, actual labor power, what is defined as legal uh, expression of labor power is reduced. So you see this in all sorts of strikes, like the John Deere strike. You can only actually protest or strike with uh, three people in this area and you have to be between this spot and this spot and we call that free speech and we call that the ability to strike and the democrats are with them uh with the republicans every step of the way except for when it's time to fundraise on uh making it harder and harder like at the exact same time we're having this freak out about like Ooh, why does this person feel the need to speak out about uh israeli uh, settler colonialism at a speech we're also telling people you can't even strike mm -hmm. because actually any sort of loss that the company sees th that's coming out of your pockets that's primary